So, Charlotte, what's your favourite bit of this month's episode? It's got to be written in Tajikistan. Yeah, that's fantastic. He's hunting for the ghoul. You know he's going back? Yeah. Did you know that he's planning to wear some special clothes like this? Why is that? Because every nice ghoul loves a sailor. My name's John Downs and welcome to another episode of On The Track. Hello Richard, welcome back. How was the expedition? Chris Clark, Dave Archer and myself have been to Tajikistan, specifically to the Romit Valley area, uh, in search of hairy wild men, known locally as the Gul or Dev. Uh, we assumed that they were similar to the ones seen in Russia, uh, known as the Elmasti, which we've been on the track of before but it seems there were some subtle differences. We journeyed along the two forks of the Rovit Valley for about a fortnight, camping out, speaking to witnesses, putting up camera traps and uh, wandering around to see what we could see. Uh, we talked to an awful lot of eyewitnesses who had seen these creatures, uh, which they described about the height of a human being, of an average human being, with covered in long hair, either dark yellow or black in colour, females having long drooping breasts, uh, faces with sunken eyes, thick brow ridges, flattened noses, broad mouths, very monkey-like, and oddly the, the feature that they stressed the most was the strange nature of the creature's thumbs. They, were, they always said, and the first thing they said when they were describing a ghoul is that its thumb is much further back on the hand than a human thumb is, giving it a grip much more like that of a chimpanzee than a human being, which is a very archaic feature, unless of course it's plesiomorphic. We also, uh, surprisingly, found lots of eyewitnesses to the supposedly extinct Caspian Tiger. Now, these were supposed to have died out in the 1960s, but there have been many sightings uh, in the, the two forks of the Romit Valley, uh, including one by a park ranger. Now, these creatures have been seen killing and eating wild goat and deer, and there have been a number of sightings of, of females with cubs, so it looks like the Caspian Tiger is not extinct. From what you were saying earlier, I got the impression that the ghoul was one of the most aggressive of the Mambis out of the ones you searched for. The ghoul seems more aggressive than any of the other mystery primates we've searched for. Uh, the Yeti in northern India, despite its immense size, three metres, um, would often roar and bellow and, and shake, shake vegetation and scare the witnesses, but it didn't physically attack them. Uh, the Almasti uh, again didn't physically attack the witnesses, nor, the, nor did the Orang Pendek, they just wanted to get out of the way. Uh, the ghoul has attacked, it's thrown stones at people. Uh, there was a story about a, a man being pursued by two of these creatures who had to lock himself in a mill whilst they banged on the door and leapt on the roof. But the thing we got most was female ghoul attacking male human beings. One guy was attacked by one of these things and pinned to the ground until he could punch it in the face and run and lock himself in his car and then drive away. Another guy was attacked from behind when he was cutting grass and the thing grabbed a hold of him and seized him in its arms. Both of these men seemed to think that these were sexual attacks and the creature was interested in mating with them rather than, than violent attacks. Do the people you spoke to about the ghoul consider them to be an animal, human, a spirit or something else? Almost all of the witnesses say that the ghoul is some sort of primitive man. They look at it as a, a, a relative of man or a primitive human, although not obviously homo sapien. 
what the guy that was pursued by two of them uh, seemed to think that they were animals. But uh, then where do you draw the line of, of what is an animal and what is a man? Uh, is an ape an animal, for instance, that's closely related to us? What's the next step for the search for the ghoul in Tajikistan? Well, we have some dung samples that were found by Dave Archer. I think they're probably going to turn out to be from a bear. We know that there are bears in the area. We'll get those analysed probably by our old friend Lars Thomas. It's a very rich area in number of reports. So uh, we may go back at some stage. I know Dave and, uh, and Chris are, are eager to go back again. So it could be an area that we revisit. Uh, Chris is on about going to the west of Tajikistan where the lakes are next time. So uh, maybe the CFZ will go back to, to Tajikistan. It remains to be seen. Perhaps even more exciting than the ghoul is reports we had in the same area of the Caspian tiger. The Caspian tiger is a subspecies of tiger that was found in Central Asia, uh, the second largest of all the tigers after the Siberian tiger. It had a very long fluffy coat to deal with the harsh winters. It was supposed to have been uh, hunted into extinction. Hunting and habitat loss was supposed to have done for it by the 1960s. But we had very many reports of the, of the Caspian tiger from hunters and shepherds and even a park ranger who had seen one uh, just over a month ago. And we've had sightings involving Caspian tigers killing and eating a wild goat and deer and coming and taking livestock and we've had several reports of females with cubs. So it seems like the Caspian tiger isn't extinct, but it's thriving in the Womit Valley area. But the Caspian tiger is not the only other mystery cat, which has been hypothesized to still be living in the wilds of Tajikistan. The Asiatic cheetah was once found across the Indian subcontinent all the way to the Middle East, and Tajikistan was one of the heartlands of its range. It was extirpated across much of its range in the mid-20th century and now, sadly, there are only thought to be less than a hundred specimens left. In the eastern central arid region of Iran, an area where the human population is very low indeed. But could it still exist in Tajikistan? This was one of the questions I was most looking forward to asking Richard. Did you hear any accounts? of cheetahs. We heard no accounts of cheetahs but some people said there were three cats in the area. The tiger, the snow leopard and another cat that just had dots on it rather than rosettes. Now whether they meant the common leopard as opposed to the snow leopard or the Asiatic cheetah is debatable, but it was a mountain area uh, and cheetahs are more creatures of the open plains, so I think that the third cat is more likely to be uh, the standard leopard rather than the cheetah. We will be back with Richard next episode and we will take a more in-depth look at some of his interviews with eyewitnesses. But now, let's look at penguins. Well, here we like a joke as much as anyone. And over the last few episodes, we have pointed out a few things which turned out to be hoaxes. And here's another one. Cue card holder is having trouble with the paper. <laughs> Come back, Charlotte! <laughs> a group of five adult Magellanic penguins set up home on Felixstowe Beach during January the first to ever settle naturally in the UK. They were spotted on the pebbled beach close to the spa pavilion. I think they were probably there because they were hoping to catch a bit of live music from the aforementioned pavilion, just in order to emulate those wonderful cartoon penguins in Mary Poppins. But anyway, these penguins normally live in South America and it piqued interest as to how they came to be splashing around on the Suffolk coast. It is thought likely that they hitched a ride on a container ship from the Falkland Islands to Felixstowe Port, 
which arrived the week before they were actually sighted. Zoologist William Spence from Cambridge University said, it's certainly nice and cold at the moment, so they are quite at home in the conditions and are likely to be finding plenty to eat in the North Sea. He added that while he and his team were not concerned for the penguins' welfare at the moment, they would struggle in the heat of a Suffolk summer. We will monitor the situation, he said, but it may, may be that they migrate north, where they will enjoy the colder climate. With an extraordinary twist, US President Donald Trump tweeted about this story, claiming it was proof that global warming is a myth. Hey, that makes no sense. Oh, That's what it said in the editorial there. No, I'm not saying the editorial, John. I just mean um, Mr. President is talking bollocks. Oh, really? Good <laughs> grief. Some months ago, we told you about a small colony of penguins that had turned up on a container ship and taken up home somewhere near Felixstowe in Suffolk. And it turns out that this story is a complete and utter hoax, even though we fell for it hook, line and sinker. Well done, guys. I think that the secret of a good hoax is to make it just about believable. Because the idea of penguins turning up on a container ship from somewhere in the South Atlantic is just about plausible. Whereas, for example, if they'd said that a colony of gorillas had turned up from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and set up homes somewhere near Welling Garden City, I think probably we would have smelt a rat far earlier than we actually did. But, believe it or not, there are real bona fide stories about penguins up here in the Northern Hemisphere. The king penguin is an iconic creature, second only in size to the emperor penguin. They breed on subantarctic islands between 45 and 55 degrees south at the northern reaches of Antarctica, as well as Tierra del Fuego, the Falkland Islands and other temperate islands of the region. And there is estimated to be a world population of 2.23 million individuals and, even better, the population seems to be increasing. In 1936, nine king penguins arrived in Norway on the SS Neptune. The birds had been provided by Consul Lars Christensen, who was involved in whaling in Antarctica, and the whole project had been overseen by the National Association for Natural Conservation. Two pairs of penguins were released in Rust in Lofoten, and two pairs and one juvenile were released at Josevar in Finnmark, both of these sites in northern Norway. In the ensuing years, other penguin species were released. The birds were placed on islands with easy access to the sea and no natural predators. Over the years that followed, penguins were sighted in western Finnmark and along the coast of Nordland. This continued until the last observation in 1949. It's not clear whether any of the penguins that had been released managed to reproduce, but some evidence suggests that they did. Not everyone understood what kind of creature these birds were, however, because one of the penguins wandered into a farmyard in Gamvik in 1937 and was killed by an old lady who claimed it was a freak of nature that had invaded her farmyard. Sad, but true. Now, fresh from Tajikistan, Richard is put in the hot seat for the Crypto's Crypto's. This new segment was Charlotte's idea, as was the title. With people in the CFZ spread far and wide across the globe, and of all ages from their teens to their 80s, everyone has a different opinion of their favourite Mr. Animals. And so now, each episode, we are asking a different crypto authority for their favourites. And as Charlotte said, it's time for the Crypto's Cryptids. My favourite cryptid is the dragon. It is the great great granddaddy of all monsters. Before there were demons, before there were giants, before there were vampires or werewolves or zombies or any other monster, they were dragons. 
dragon stories have been traced back by a folklorist in the USA to Africa at least 40,000 years ago, which makes them the most ancient and powerful monster archetype. They're found in every single culture on Earth, from the bat-wing fire-snorting mm -hmm. monsters of medieval Europe to the cloud-inhabiting serpentine rain gods of Asia. The Australian Aborigines have dragon-like creatures. Uh, in the Neotropics there are winged serpents and feathered serpents. They appear in every culture on Earth. They're completely global and utterly ancient. And the belief in dragons still persists in some parts of the world, particularly in Asia and in Africa, where there are sightings of still sightings of dragon-like creatures. In Mongolia, I was told of dragon-like beasts with horse-like heads, with crests on them, great serpentine bodies, bat-like wings, four short legs, association with rainfall and water, and living in clouds and wells and wherever there was water. In West Africa, I had exactly the same description as a creature with a horse-like crested head, a long serpentine body, wings, legs, and this association with water. So, you know, opposite sides of the world, virtually the same description. So that's why the dragon fascinates me so much. Its ubiquitousness, its persistence, and its hold over the human psyche. The, the original Ula monster. Now, boys, now and boys and girls, what do we have here? Yeah. Yeah. And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On The Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the latest issue of Animals and Men, the journal of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, is available to read free via the CFZ website, the CFZ Press website and the CFZ blog pages. Did we say it was free? It includes articles on blue dogs, man beasts, mystery cats, aquatic monsters, new and rediscovered, 21st century sea serpents, the water of the skies, giant shark reports, and mermaids in the Dutch tradition by Lois Moderman, as well as a report of the second Weird Weekend North, letters to the editor, and book reviews. And it's free. You can't argue with that, can you? As regular viewers will no doubt have come to realise, we at the CFZ have a long string of interesting friends scattered around the world, and this month I want to introduce you to Jan Edwards of Far Place Animal Rescue in County Durham. The other night she sent me two pieces of video which I wanted to share with you. This, the first, shows a young jackdaw called Charlie, who, after having been brought in as a youngster and hand-reared, has been released into the wide world, and who immediately upon his release decided to investigate the moss on this tree branch to see if there were any small creatures that he could devour. But the most exciting is this swift, which, again having been hand-reared, has now been released. I asked Jan what the swift was called, and she said, unfortunately, that they'd never given it a name. It was just known as Swifty. So I said, he really should have been called Tom. I strongly suspect that most of our young viewers will be too young to know what on earth I'm talking about. Something which happens with increasing regularity as I get older. But while I disappear off into old git territory, I suggest that if you're interested in animals, and if you're interested in animal welfare, you could do an awful lot worse than check these guys out on Facebook. They are wonderful people and they deserve your support very much indeed. Many of you probably know that I'm a musician, and I've actually got a new record coming out very shortly. It's called Cold Harbour, and I'm going to be able to tell you lots more about it next month. But in the meantime, I'm not the only musician in the CFZ extended family. A few episodes ago, we interviewed Steve Andrews, green activist. Well, it's now time to introduce you to Steve Andrews, singer.
and also green activist with his new record which bemoans the way that plastic is clogging this planet. Enjoy. Plastic plants, what about real plants? I saw the fake ones at the store. People must want them, people must buy them. I don't want to see any more. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you or was it me? It's not hunting that'll kill the last whale Plastic will do it, it's a very sad tale And all the albatrosses are dying out too They keep on fishing in the oceans Plastic stew Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you or was it me? The plastic bag I bought It very quickly broke If it ever gets burned There'll be poisonous smoke Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea how does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you or was it me? Plastic kills the turtles and it's eaten by the fish. Plastic's in the food chain and the dinner on your dish. Where does all the plastic go? Into the sea, into the sea How does it get there? Who threw it away? Was it you or was it me? Was it you or was it me? Was it you or was it me? It's a creature called a tenophore, and more popularly known as a sea gooseberry. And I tell you what, I am really jealous of Charlotte for having seen them, because I've never seen one and I've always wanted to. The tenophora, which are commonly known as comb jellies, comprise a phylum of invertebrate animals that live in marine waters worldwide. They are notable for the groups of cilia that they use for swimming, which are commonly referred to as combs, and they are the largest animals to swim with the help of such cilia. Depending on the species, adult tenophores range from a few millimetres in length to a metre and a half in size. Only 100 to 150 species have been validated, and there are quite possibly another 25 which have not yet been fully described and named. Almost all tenophores function as predators, taking prey ranging from microscopic larvae and rotifers to the adults of small crustaceans. The exceptions are juveniles of two species which live as parasites on the salps of which adults of their species feed. This species of sea goodbury, Pleurobranchia pileus, occurs in the northern Atlantic Ocean and along the northwestern coasts of Europe. Its range includes the Baltic Sea, the Skagorak, the Katagat and the North Sea. It's a pelagic species occurring in open water but is sometimes found in rock pools or washed up on the beach. It also occurs off the eastern Atlantic coasts of North America and in the Black Sea. This combs jelly is common around the coast of Britain, although I've never seen one, and in the North Sea in early summer. The populations in the Baltic are dependent on the inflow of saline water from the North Sea. Because of their soft gelatinous bodies, tenophores are extremely rare in the fossil record, 
and fossils that have been interpreted as thanophores have been found only in places where the environment was exceptionally suited to preservation of tough tissue. Until the mid-1990s, only two specimens good enough for analysis were known, both members of the Crown Group from the early Devonian period. Three additional putative species were then found in the Burgess Shale and other Ca Canadian rocks of similar age about 505 million years ago in the Mid-Cambrian period. These are an interesting as well as an incredibly ancient creature and I feel very honoured that we have been able to bring you film of such beautiful animals on this episode of On The Track. Thank you Charlotte. You've made an old git very happy. I love cats. So much my family and I have both. But domestic cats are responsible for many deaths of small wildlife every year. And once in a while, when cats are busy, I've said I've watched something in the British region. Where was on duty? It's just a moment. Okay, we're going to have a look at this little field mouse that we saved from the cats earlier hopefully he'll, he'll be okay there he is he seems okay just a little bit frightened there's no blood or anything on him so he, I think he'll be okay we'll just release him somewhere nice and quiet okay I think this will be a, a nice place for him her maybe Come on, little one, out you come. Here we go. Okay, we're here at the aquatic habitat. She's a, an aquatics in uh, near Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. Probably won't find anything particularly of relevance to cryptozoology but it's always nice to have a little look round and just see what species we have we have offer. When Carl isn't rescuing mice or doing much needed surgery on the trees in the CFZ garden, he often spends time wandering around local aquatic shops, local to him that is, and something I've always been jealous of is that the tropical fish shops in other parts of the country seem to be so much better stocked than the ones in my little corner of North Devon. But Carl's actually wrong. There are all sorts of things of cryptozoological importance which can be found, if you're lucky, in tropical fish shops like these. The L number system is a pseudo-scientific classification system of catfish based on photographs of shipments of tropical catfish of the family Loricardiae, published by the German aquarium magazine DATS. The first L number was published in 1988. An L number is not a formal scientific designation, but it allows people to identify various Loricarid catfish by common name before the fish is officially described. When the Loricaro receives an official scientific name, the L number or numbers are retired and best practice then is to use the scientific name. A specific L number classification does not guarantee a discrete species. Multiple L numbers have been given to different populations of the same species and to add to the confusion, sometimes a single L number may be used for multiple species. But it's a start. And in shops like this, one can quite often find undescribed species of fish, particularly these L-numbered catfish, but also, quite often, some of the cichlids from the Rift Valley Lake Complex in East Africa. These are being brought into culture faster than they can be described. And so, yes, Carl, there are things of cryptozoological importance that can easily be found in shops like this. And now to Korea, for a monthly visit to the Watch of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably 
because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird, a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have, and that's what this segment on the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals, and in the UK what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies.
Kirkosaurine lizards represent a substantial component of the reptile fauna in the Neotropics. Several attempts have been made to reconstruct the phylogenetic relationships within this group, but most studies focused on particular genera or regions and did not cover the subfamily as a whole. In a recent study, material from the montane forests of Peru was newly sequenced. Silvasaura brava, a new genus and new species of arboreal gymnothalmid lizard, has been described from the montane forest of the pre pre protected forest, Provincia de Chachameo, Peru. A new species of the coral snake genus, Sinomacurus, is described based on four specimens from southern Hainan Island, China. Morphologically, the new species is rather similar to Sinomacurus caelogi. However, it's distinct from S. Kelogi by the pattern on the head, the head length, head length and width, the number of infralabial scales, the number of bands on the dorsal body and the number of blotches on the belly. Two new species of Turima are described in New Guinea, one from the southeastern end of Normanby Island in Mill Bay Province, the other from Kendrawasi Bay, West Papua on the northeastern coast. The dorsal surface of the eye of both species is blue in life, a characteristic not reported elsewhere in the genus. Although the species look very similar in life and both occupy similar mesophatic rubble habitats in the 70 to 50 meter depth range, they are separated both genetically and morphologically. We report the discovery of a new geographically disjunct and morphologically distinctive species of direct developing frog of the genus Phrynopus. The species is called Phrynopus maria charlos. The changes considerably our understanding of the species in this Andean genus. The type locality lies on a sub-cordillera of the extreme northern eastern portion of the Cordillera Central of Peru, on the headwaters of the Mayo River, Amazonas Department. This area is situated 170 kilometers to the northeast from the northernmost record of Phrynopus known so far. The European flounder, Platychus flacus, displays two contrasting reproductive behaviors in the Baltic Sea, offshore spawning of pelagic eggs and coastal spawning of demersal eggs a behaviour observed exclusively in the Baltic. Previous studies showed marked differences in behavioural, physiological and life history traits of flanders with pelagic and demersal eggs. Furthermore, a recent study demonstrated that flanders with pelagic and demersal eggs represent two reproductively isolated parapetric species arising from two distinct colonisation events from the same ancestral population. Using morphological data, the researchers first established that the sin types on which the original description of P. flacus was based belonged to the pelagic spawning lineage. They then used a combination of morphological and physiological characters, as well as genome-wide genetic data, to describe flanders with demersal eggs as a new species, Taticlis solendo. Chanastictos is a new species of snakehead which has been described from the river Caladan and its tributaries in Mizoram, northeastern India, based on comparison of morphological and molecular features with closely related species. Chanastictos is morphologically similar to Chana ornatopinis, described from the Rakhine state of Myanmar, however it differs from it in having black spots on the dorsal and ventral sides of the head, 
versus no spots on the dorsal and ventral side of the head, but rather spots restricted to the post-orbital lateral region of the head, and lacking dark spots on the anal fin of juveniles versus presence of a series of up to 10 dark spots in onus penis. Cobras are amongst the most widely known venom snakes, and yet their taxonomy remains incompletely understood, particularly in Africa. Here the researchers used a combination of mitochondrial and nuclear gene sequences and morphological data to diagnose species limits within the African forest cobra, Naja melanotuca. Mitochondrial DNA sequences reveal deep divergences within this taxon. Congruent patterns of variation in mitochondrial DNA, nuclear genes and morphology support the recognition of five separate species, confirming the species status of Naja subfulva and Naja periscobari, revealing two previously unnamed West African species which are described as Naja guineensis from the Upper Guinea forest of West Africa and Naja savanula, a banded form from the savannah forest mosaic of the Guinean Sudanian savannas of West Africa. The discovery of cryptic diversity in this iconic group highlights our limited understanding of tropical African biodiversity, hindering our ability to conserve it effectively. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. First, there's this. Don't ask me, I'm only the director. But I intend to return to Tajikistan to look at Richard's footage interviewing some of the witnesses who report seeing a ghoul. And there's all sorts of other stuff, but at the moment things are up in the air, so I can't really commit to anything. But there will be an episode. And there's this. Ever since we restarted this show back in the summer, we've been telling you how Louis was going to set up a Patreon campaign. Well, he's done it. And you can come, see what he's done, and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching this month's episode, and we hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it. Make sure to hit that like button and to subscribe, as well as clicking the bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video. And please share this video on social media. Thank you, and goodbye! Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of another episode. Thank you very much for watching. As I say each time, I hope you enjoyed it as much as you enjoyed putting it together. Doing this show is one of the highlights of my month, and I'm very, very pleased with the response you get. As people who've been reading our regular daily blog, you know, we've had a couple of family crises in the last few weeks. We're bearing up and things are all looking positive and we're moving in the right direction. Thank you very much to everybody who has sent their love, their prayers and their good wishes to us. It really is humbling to be at the receiving end with so much positive vibration. And if I sound like an old hippie, I think I have an old hippie. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got all sorts of exciting things coming up in the future. That's just going to have to be for next month, if I'm right about that. Thank you very much for everybody who worked through so hard on this episode and to everybody who supported us in the wider field of the CFC through the last month. Thanks, guys. Without your help, we truly couldn't do what we want to do. So, I'm off now, and we'll be back with more stuff next month. So, until then, see you next